Welcome into the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. And if you haven't yet, please make sure to subscribe below. Great show lined up for you today. I'm going to be giving out my defensive grades for Packers Bears, my highest graded players, my lowest graded players. And in fact, this was actually my highest graded game of the season for the defense. That might surprise you given some of the explosive plays against a Bears offense that was really struggling coming in, but I have my reasons and we'll go over all of those in just a moment. But before we get there, we certainly had some news and notes that are going to be worth going over from Monday. None more important than the fact that the Packers are now the number one seed in the NFL, the number one seed in the NFC, holding the tiebreaker with the Cardinals and the Buccaneers following the Cardinals' loss to the Rams on Monday Night Football. Yes, they do hold that tiebreaker based on NFC record, which will be ever so important the remainder of this season. And most importantly, if Green Bay wins out in their last four games, they will be the number one seed. They will get that by and they will uh, have the opportunity to host the playoffs at Lambeau Field. That is a huge uh, you know, development for this Packers team, and they are set up to, again, if they can win out, have everything go through Lambeau Field. And in this all-in season, last dance, whatever you want to call it, and everything that's gone on, having that by, having everything at Lambeau Field, I know that they're, they've had some of those opportunities in the past and they haven't been able to pay them off. There's no two ways about it. Not having to face a team in that first round uh, and then having home field advantage throughout the playoffs and, and making you know players like Stafford and Brady, Kyler Murray, whomever it may be, have to play in the cold at Lambeau Field is still an advantage and certainly one that would give the Packers the best path to making the Super Bowl. So it was a big step in the right direction. This is not going to be an easy stretch of games for the remainder of the season. Tampa Bay has literally the easiest schedule, uh, strength of schedule wise of any team in the NFL, not just of the contending teams, not just of the NFC teams, of any team in the NFL. They are almost, they are very likely to win out, right? So that's going to put you know pressure on Green Bay to also win out uh, to get that number one seed. I do think that even if they uh, you know lose another game, I think Arizona is going to end up losing another game. So this should give Green Bay a really big opportunity uh, to, at worst, hopefully, if it, you know, again, even if they lose one game, be the number two seed. Uh, but we all know they they are gunning for that number one seed, home field advantage, and that ever so important bye week. So a huge development for Green Bay with Arizona losing, and if now if Green Bay takes care of business. Again, everything will go through Lambeau Field. So remaining schedule, Baltimore Ravens, uh, a piece of no, uh, news and notes from that game. It sounds like the plan right now for the Ravens is for Lamar Jackson to play. We'll definitely be monitoring that through the course of the week to see what happens there. But as of right now, Lamar Jackson is expected to play. Again, we'll see what the rest of the, re- the, rest of the week brings, excuse me. And then uh, following that, you've got uh, games against the Cleveland Browns on Christmas Day. And then following that, you have Minnesota at home, currently set for Sunday night football, and then the, and then the Detroit Lions. So definitely not an easy schedule. I think Browns, Ravens, Vikings all pose different challenges. And you know, weirdly enough, the Lions are, are still a fighting team, right? Like they, they haven't exactly like caved in to, to pretty much anyone and uh, even picked up a win in the process. So not not the toughest schedule in the world, but not the easiest one either. And all four of those games will pose different challenges. Other news and notes, Billy Turner may not be done for the season. That was a huge update from Matt LaFleur. Nothing guaranteed, nothing set in stone, but the initial diagnosis wasn't just an immediate like torn ACL or anything like that. And I think, I know we're all laser focused in on this season right now, but even as you start looking ahead to next year, Billy Turner and Elton Jenkins are both going to be on this roster next year. And if you have to start a season where this team is potentially having to go through uh, some really tough cuts and some really tough decisions, and there's going to be players that, you know, just they're going to have to move on from based on salary cap restraints, not having Elton Jenkins and Billy Turner for a big chunk of that season next year would have been devastating, right? We, and we know that, you know, Elton's going to miss a lot of time, use kind of the same you know, injury path of David Bakhtiari, if, if you want right now, he, we could be looking at December of next year before Elton's back. If all of a sudden Billy Turner had a torn ACL, you're looking at potentially December, January for Billy Turner next year. And going into next year with no Turner and no Elton Jenkins for a huge chunk of the year, again, knowing that you're also going to be, you know, salary cap strapped and you're going to have to get rid of some guys, that would have made things very challenging. So 
Great news on Billy Turner. And even if he's not able to play this season, it looks like it's not going to be something that would go into the beginning of next year, which again, I know we're all focused and laser focused in on this year right now in this all in season, but it definitely has ramifications going into next year as well. So good news on Billy Turner. Also, they are hopeful that David Bakhtiari is going to practice this week. They at minimum expect Jair Alexander to continue in individual drills uh, in practice. So he will continue to practice in some capacity. And again, Matt LaFleur said at minimum individual drills, which means he could potentially get some team activities this week. I don't expect either of those players, Bakhtiari or Jair, to play this week, regardless of what their practice status is this week. I think they're both still going to be in some sort of ramp up period, uh, but we'll see as again, this week continues to go on. I think mostly that's good news for Bakhtiari and, and Jair, at least right now. Danny Etling was released from the practice squad. So another move there, you know, I'm, I'm guessing they're expecting Love to come back from uh, COVID list this week, which would make that a little bit easier not having to have that emergency quarterback in Danny Etling. And then last but not least, Matt LaFleur mentioned that they may have to be all hands on deck with special teams, meaning that starters could play on special teams as well, including players like Alan Lazard and Razul Douglas. So we'll see exactly how they go about doing that. But it, it's probably time, right? This is put up or shut up time and you have the opportunity to go out and get the number one seed. You, you can't be losing games because of your special teams not being able to cover kicks or punts and all the other stuff that's been going on. So yeah, it's, it's probably time to have a little bit more of an all hands on deck mentality. All right. Let's go over this defensive game because again, as I mentioned, it was my highest grade of the season for the defense. Now I want to be clear. In my opinion, it was not the best game the Packers played on defense this season. So how do those two reconcile, right? Again, and I've mentioned this before, these are individual grades, player by player. I'm grading every player on every play and assigning them a grade. And I think a great example of this is the uh, the touchdown pass to Demir Bird, right? Henry Black in coverage on the play, another one of those angle routes where we've seen him get beat on a few different occasions. He gets beat and everyone else is sort of doing their job on the play. Um, uh, Darnell Savage crashes down and is playing in a robber. I think in all likelihood, he probably should have been sort of anticipating that route and playing more in the middle of the field. He takes sort of another uh, intermediate defender or uh, intermediate receiver. And when they're sort of covered, he goes out and takes the flat sort of an interesting path there for Savage, uh, but that left the entire uh, other side of the field because Amos is shading to the only deep ball uh, that's, uh, which was to the, you know, if you're watching the tape on the right side of the field, um, which left Bird once he gets past Black, there's nobody left on the left side of the field. So maybe a slight great, you know, negative grade for Savage based on sort of the route he took as a robber on that play. Certainly a negative grade for Henry Black, but you look at everything else and there's nothing too egregious, uh, you know, uh, else on that play, right? You're seeing positives uh, from individuals throughout the remainder of that play. The grade or the, the play in general is a huge negative for the defense, giving up an explosive play, uh, but it was good offense. Henry Black needed to play that a little bit better. You would have maybe liked to see Savage play that a little bit better. Uh, but it, as you grade up that play, it's not a huge negative on the score sheet, right? Because so many players grade in the positive, maybe two guys in the negative, and it doesn't look overall that bad, but we know it's a bad play overall on defense. Jakeem Grant play, the huge end around, right? Gorgeous play call by the Bears. And a couple things you would have liked to see differently. Once again, Darnell Savage would have liked to have seen him take a much better angle on the play and play that a bit safer, making sure that he's the last line of defense and that Jakeem Grant has to get by him. Instead, he takes a very aggressive pursuit angle and completely, you know, by the time he gets to the you know, point of attack, Jakeem Grant is well past. So a, a, a poor angle by Savage on that play. And then Razul Douglas had the opportunity to make the tackle at the end and couldn't. A couple negative grades there, but again, nothing super egregious. And uh, overall, it was a great play call and a fantastic play by Jakeem Grant. Sometimes you grade the, the offensive players in the positive, and sometimes the, the scheme just out schemes you, right? And in this case, you go in and you look at this play and there's four defenders on that side. Preston's nor, you know, doing his thing where he's sort of like you know, reading the play. And by the time he's reading the play and, and still in the process of setting the edge, by the time he has the opportunity to go out and get out on Jakeem Grant, Jakeem Grant's a 4-2-40 guy, right? Preston Smith's not going to be able to get out on him. So Jakeem Grant just gets around him. That eliminates that edge defender. And then meanwhile, you've got five bears that are pulling. There's four Packers defenders. And these five bears just basically take out all of the defenders. And Jakeem Grant's got an alley. Again, Razul had an opportunity to make a tackle at the end and just couldn't get him down. But 
it was a great play by the Bears. Those were their two explosives. Nothing like super egregious that you're grading on either of those plays. Again, you look at the 30-point performance, you're like, man, that's a bad defensive performance against the Bears. Remember, seven was on special teams, so I'm not grading the defense on that play, and I don't grade the special teams at all. Um, I grade offense and defense. So again, defensively, that seven points isn't going to count against them. That leaves 23 points. And then again, the two big explosives was really all the, the point production that was given up. And again, no major egregious individual grades on those plays. So would you have liked to see maybe the safeties be a little bit more safe in a couple of those situations and Darnell Savage maybe take some better angles? Yeah, I think that's fair. Would you have liked to have seen Razul Douglas make that tackle? Yes. But outside of those two explosive plays, this was a really good performance on defense. And I know that's sort of like saying, well, yeah, let's just take away the, the two you know plays that give 14 points. I'm not saying that you should do that. And that's why I'm saying this was not Green Bay's best performance defensively. I don't think, again, I'm, I'm saying anything controversial there. But if you look at the individual grades and how everyone did in this game, the individual grades, I thought everyone in their individual matchups was winning far more often than not. Only four players graded in the negative in this game. And only two of them were really anything you know of note. And, you know, overall, and I think another aspect of this, right, look at some of those Justin Fields runs and some of those plays that are going for, for decent games, gains for Justin Fields. This is another example of look at the coverage on those plays and the coverage is usually pretty darn good, which is why Fields has to, you know, bring the ball down. And usually there's a couple guys that are getting immediate pressure, which is why Fields has to get his, you know, eyes down and start taking off and running. Now, one defensive player in a lot of these situations, sometimes it was on the interior, sometimes it was Gary you know, getting sucked inside and Fields was able to escape outside, but there's just one defender that gets out of their gap or their alley. And because of that, Fields is able to step up or step out and get out of the pocket and, and you know, make a play with his legs. And again, you might look at like nine or 10 guys grading neutral or in the positive in, on that play. And one guy missing his assignment in the middle of the field or you know, kind of getting out of his gap gives the Bears a you know 15-yard run maybe from fields. And again, you look at that play and that play is going to grade well in the positive by individual grades. Obviously, if you're looking at it from a team standpoint, it was a net negative. So in this game, there was not as good of team defense as I think Green Bay would have liked. And I think if you look at what Preston Smith was saying, you know, obviously I wasn't there, but I think that's probably the message that they're getting across, right? Is, you know, it's one thing to play good individual defense, but they weren't playing quite as well as a team, which in a way is, is sort of a, the antithesis of how they've played a lot of games this season where there haven't been these huge, massive individual grades for, for Green Bay at times, but the team defense has been very good. In this game, we saw a little bit of the opposite where the individuals were winning their matchups far more often than not, but you saw the team maybe not play quite as cohesively this week, which again, allowed some of those explosive plays. And again, tip your cap to the Bears a little bit on a few of those plays as well. But again, take away those two big explosives, you know, what, three field goals? You know, in the second half, they went fumble, punt, 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 field goal interception. You had a pick six in the game. Uh, you had a game ceiling interception by... Um, uh, by Shannon Sullivan. Like there was a lot of good that the defense did in that game. So I know maybe on, on paper and as you're watching it, maybe you're thinking the defense had this like brutal game. Just didn't see it that way at all. I thought, again, individually, I thought everyone played very, very well. And in the second half, we started to see those individual performances mesh with a, a team defense and it was game over. Chicago had no chance, scored three points in the second half, got a huge sack fumble by Preston Smith, which led to points for Green Bay, game ceiling interception by Shannon Sullivan. Uh, I thought this was a really great uh, second, really, really great second half performance. And again, even the first half, certainly not bad when you look at the individual grades. Top three graded defenders in this game. Number one, no surprise, Razul Douglas. He's just playing a phenomenal, phenomenal brand of football right now. As I mentioned, did have the missed tackle on the Jakeem Grant play. A couple other plays early in the first quarter, uh, maybe early second quarter. I think prior to the, the pick six, I think he was right around a neutral grade. So I hadn't done anything too spectacular up until that point. Did almost have the interception earlier where he got flagged for pass interference. And I didn't think that was a pass interference. I graded that play in the positive. Actually would have liked to have seen him come up with that ball, to be honest. It was a slight positive grade in the end. But um, overall, it was, you know before the pick six, it was somewhat you know, a neutral grade. And then the pick six, and then he just had a fantastic game after that. 
sticky in coverage, almost coming up with a couple more picks. Like he was just really, really good the remainder of that game. Preston Smith was number two, consistent pressure, set the edge, sack fumble, sack late in the game, you name it. Preston Smith was all over the place and was a key contributor to the Packers in this one. And the number three was Dean Lowry, consistent pressure in the middle of the defense. Uh, He graded out as the best interior defensive lineman. A lot of honorable mentions in this uh, game for players who also graded well into the positive. Kenny Clark, Kingsley Kiki, Devondre Campbell, Eric Stokes, Shannon Sullivan all had really nice games in the positive. But again, top three, Razul, Preston, and Dean Lowry. On the flip side, again, only four players graded in the negative. Two of them were just slight negatives, Jonathan Garvin and Adrian Amos. Um, I thought Amos, uh, more of just a nondescript game. Like there weren't any real major negatives. Couple plays, I think he could have done something better. Didn't really have a ton of opportunities to make any real big splash or positive plays, which is, it was more a lack of opportunity than almost anything for Amos. Uh, But the two players I had graded uh, that were in the negative, the second lowest was Henry Black. Multi, you know, he had, he had the missed interception. There were two angle routes that he missed, including the big touchdown to Bird. Like there were just far too many errors for for Henry Black, and I do think they have to reevaluate if he's the guy that they want in that position. They have some other options. I would like to maybe see them experiment with that the last four weeks, whether that's a Vernon Scott, whether that's a Rasul Douglas playing that role, uh, especially when Jair Alexander comes back. I do think they have some mix and match. Um, opportunities there. Uh, but I think you have to question whether or not Henry Black is is the, the picture perfect guy for that role. And then my lowest graded player in this game was Darnell Savage. And I already mentioned some of the, the poor angles. There were the two, uh, again, on the touchdowns, I think the, the robber play on the bird touchdown, where I think ideally you would have liked to maybe see that play, uh, play that a little bit different. Maybe that's a little harsh. It wasn't a major negative grade on that play. Uh, but more importantly, I thought the, the Jakeem Grant play I just thought he took a very aggressive and poor angle on that play. Didn't come close to to Jakeem and um, ultimately abandoned his his spot on the field as sort of the last line of defense. And it ended up costing Green Bay a touchdown on that play. And then there were just some plays late in the game where he took some really bizarre angles. And you just, again, there, there's some times where, where Darnell just gets caught in no man's land a little bit. And, uh, you know, again, when he, when you see him reacting and using his instincts and using his speed, he can be really, really good. There were a couple really nice plays in coverage on this game, including a one-on-one with uh, Allen Robinson. By no way, shape, or form was this all bad uh, from Darnell Savage. There were some good stuff too, but I, the way this defense is playing and the way these corners are covering, the way the run defense is playing, the way uh, the edge rushers and, and the pass rushers getting to the quarterback, the way Campbell and Barnes are playing on the second level, Right now, Green Bay doesn't really need Amos and Savage to be these, you know, risk takers, right? Just don't allow explosive plays and make teams go the length of the field against you and you're going to have a really good chance. So I think if Savage can play just a bit more safe and put, you know, safe back into that safety position, I think Green Bay's defense is going to have much more opportunity to limit some of those explosive plays that we've seen in these last three games, really, Minnesota, LA Rams, and then uh, this most recent game as well. Um, so I, I think I think there's some opportunity there, but uh, overall, again, Douglas Smith and Lowry, my top three, Savage, Black, and Amos, my bottom three. I got to get out of here. That's going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. Always appreciate it. We'll be right back here tomorrow with Rachel Hotmeyer. You won't want to miss it, so make sure to join and subscribe. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.